Good afternoon, folks. My name is John Kazmierowski. I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer for ImageX, and it uh, looks like we've got uh, a good number of uh, ImageX folks here. Thanks a lot for filling in the crowd. Say hi to everybody. You know, this is my first Drupal conference. I've been working with Drupal for about six or seven years, and I've never been to DrupalCon. And I learned something really, really uh, early on at DrupalCon. I learned how you can identify a core contributor at a cocktail party. They tell you. <laughs> so um, so I fi I've met a few of them already. But today we're not going to talk too much about jokes. We're going to talk about Drupal and higher education. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what kind of complexity higher education uh, meets. And in fact, before we get started, how many people are uh, in higher education? I'm thinking a lot of you folks are. Great. So you, a lot of this stuff may not be new to you. What we're going to talk about is not only the complexity you face, but uh, a little bit about uh, how we can manage that complexity. But before we get started, I want to talk. Uh, I want to ask you another little question. What do you think? Uh, cats and cowboys, uh, Albert Einstein, mammalian biology, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need, and uh, a cloud computing pioneer from the '80s have in common? Well, we're going to talk about all those things today. And so uh, I know it's five o'clock, or it's about five o'clock, and I know they've already started serving beer. So we're going to try and make this a little bit interesting. Before we get started, though, I want to give you a little bit of an introduction to ImageX and what we do in the EDU space. This isn't going to be a great big sales pitch, but we do want to spend a little bit of time on telling you why we think uh, uh, we've got the experience to talk about this. And that brings up Albert Einstein. One of the things he said was the best source of knowledge is experience. Well, he said that before Google. Um, and <laughs> the other thing is uh, the uh, best source for great quotes is brainy quotes. So if you're ever looking for great quotes, go over there. So I want to talk a little bit about our experience. First of all, we've delivered web services to some of the largest universities in uh, the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we uh, maintain an extensive uh, presence in the EDU market space, not only here at DrupalCon, but at many other um, you know, regional and national uh, and international uh, EDU shows. Our team, our EDU team, the team that's focused specifically on EDU, offers over 40 years of experience not working for EDU, but working in EDU. So we've got an idea of kind of how, how things work in, uh, in that environment. And uh, we're beginning to offer something that we call OpenEDU. We'll talk about that way at the end. But OpenEDU is essentially a Drupal accelerator that supports the EDU marketplace. And I see some of the folks here uh, are clients of ours who uh, have already experienced some of that. Well, what have we experienced? We talked about our experience a lot. What have we experienced? What is our experience in EDU? Well, these are some of the things that we found challenges that face EDU. And I think you've probably seen some or all of these in the past. Changing demographics are increasing pressure on enrollment. You know, essentially, people are having fewer babies. And so people, you know, the universities have to go further and further afield to fill their roles. Uh, they have to look for people outside their region. They have to look for folks uh, and, and students who might be international students. They're looking for students who are coming back from the workplace. So these changing demographics uh, increase pressure on the schools. Emerging, te emerging technology trends uh, increase pressure on schools. Everything from massive online uh, courseware to the, the University of Phoenix of the world, this technology challenge is also placing a, uh, a, a big burden or a big challenge to the traditional university. The other thing we find a lot, and this happens in big universities and small, the uneven distribution of wealth. You might have one school inside the university that just got $50 million to build a new, uh, a, a new building. Boy, they've got all the wealth they need to do whatever they want. And then you've got other uh, departments or programs that might need a little extra help. And so this uneven distribution of wealth causes uh, challenges for common goals. And then, you know, you've got administrators who are charting char more, better, faster, cheaper. You know, they want all of these things. And it always favors tactics, or it sometimes favors, favors tactics over strategy. So we're constantly tactically ap approaching things when we should be uh, thinking more strategically. And these are some of the kinds of challenges from a, uh, you know, kind of the esoteric challenges or the, um, uh, the existential challenges of uh, facing EDU. There's some more concrete things that are facing EDU. So all of these things that happen around EDU, the, the demographics and the politics and the organizational structures, end up creating, we think, four really key, really tough things that you have to deal with when you're talking about a web ecosystem. How do you manage brand security? How do you secure your brand and make sure that regardless of how many websites you have and regardless of how they were funded and regardless of what message you're telling, that they're telling kind of the same brand message. You're giving that. 
how do we maintain data security and content governance? You know, we talk a lot about, you know, wanting uh, organizations. We got one organization, for instance, a, a client of ours who has over 1,200 individual sites uh, that are uh, deployed for their university, about 400 of which are actually under active management. That means 800 sites where they have a very limited view of data security and content governance. How do you get that under control without forcing a, you know, a, a very tightly controlled environment that nobody really wants? Compliance. We talk about compliance a lot with our clients, whether it's compliance with accessibility issues, compliance with data security issues, or data privacy issues. All of these things become important as well. And then a big one, again, because there is such a wide variety of organizational structure and such a wide variety of w the way people make decisions, uh, you get redundancy, you get inefficiencies, and you get an overall lack of system economy in a lot of universities that we deal with these days. So what we found is we found that there are kind of two dichotomous truths, two truths that on the face of them don't seem to match very well. But this is something that we find in our space all the time. Institutional structure and mandate differ greatly. You know, you go from organization to organization, from university to university, from school to school within the university, department to department, and their structure and their mandate change almost daily. And then the other problem or the other truth Institutions share common needs and goals. So while they have maybe very different structures, they do have common needs and goals. So for instance, on the, uh, structure man uh, on the uh, structures and mandates side, centralized versus decentralized versus hybrid. How are decisions made? Are they made centrally? We've got some clients that are just a dream to work with because they've got a lot of centralization uh, and they get to really have a, have a good say in what's going on in the organization. Yeah, I dream clients. <laughs> and, and then, uh, you know, we also have this uh, issue where decisions become matter of preference over common good. When someone's got a great big check and that check didn't come from the university, it came from a research grant or it came from a, a alumni or a donor to build a building or to construct a school, those decisions that are made on the website in the ecosystem sometimes become matter of preference. I like this, I don't like that, as opposed to a matter of common good. And then again, brand and content issues abound. How do I manage content? If someone creates content, how do I make sure that it tells my story? How do I make sure it's not offensive? In fact, I was reading on CNN today on, on the plane, just a little side point. A couple of guys had, had uh, jumped a camera and made a couple of comments that ended up on Facebook. And the Facebook backlash was so strong against the companies that they worked for, even though they weren't in a official capacity, that one of them got fired and another one got put on two-week hiatus. So it's those sorts of content issues that sometimes also abound. When people are creating content and you, know what it, you don't know what it is or how it is or how quality controlled it is, you have kind of issues there as well. We also talk about the common needs and goals. Everybody we talk to, every one of our institutional uh, clients, every one of our universities says we need better integration across the campus. If a student comes to us and they start looking at biology and they end up at math or they end up in business, boy, we would really like that story to sound and look the same. We'd, we, we don't want the jarring changes going from one school to another. We want everything to kind of flow well together. And because of the changing demographics, because of the pro process uh, uh, or the challenges in enrollment, we need more means to engage a wider audience. We have to engage students, 16 and 17 year old students, and I have a 16 year old student, they're tough to engage. We have to, uh, we have to engage their parents. They're almost tougher. I coach kids, uh, these 16 year old kids. Engaging their parents can even be tougher sometimes. But we have to talk to alumni, we have to talk to donors, we have to talk to faculty, we have to make them look good on the site. We have to talk to all kinds of different people. And again, we talk about the, the need for cheaper, better, faster administration of our systems. So these kinds of things really play against each other when you start thinking about what am I going to do for my university? How am I going to use Drupal to support my university's web presence? What am I going to do about all of these things? We're going to take a quick step back and we're going to talk a little bit about Maslow's hierarchy of need. Now everyone understands what Maslow's hierarchy of need is. The theory basically goes something like this. It was developed in the 1940s that before a person can feel really good about what their hair looks like, they have to have food on the table. And not only do they have to have food on the table today, but they have to have a pretty good idea that there's going to be food on the table tomorrow. And they have to have those base needs taken care of before they can reach their aspirational needs. We see the same thing in universities today. We see some of those base needs or some of those aspirational needs, you know, essentially, you know, organizations start with, is the power on? 
do I have servers? Are they, are, you know, are they properly running? Do I have an internet connection? Uh -oh. oh, I'm sorry, I went uh, the wrong way. You know, <laughs> the, the second one, will there be a power and connection tomorrow? So, you know, my first need is, can I get this thing up and running? The second need is, can I keep it running? You know, the, well, I keep on doing that. Sorry about that. The third one, you know, is, uh, is my data secure? You know, once I've been able to, se to secure my environment, I can get it up and running, I can keep it running. Is my data secure? Is it, is it uh, protected from loss? The fourth one, does my site look cool? You know, now I'm, fi I'm finally getting to the point where I can think about more aspirational things. And then finally, and this is the one that a lot of organizations struggle with, because they can do these, these uh, lower things. The one they really struggle with is pressing the right button. Uh, <laughs> They, uh, they, the one they really struggled with is, are we more effective? Are we more economical? Are we better coordinated? So they go from the me to the we, from the me, you know, from the, the, from the private to the society. And those are the kinds of things that we, uh, what, that we talk about with our clients. How do you work as an organization up that la ladder of, uh, of needs? Well, you know, You've probably seen a lot of the stuff that, uh, that you see up here. Universities face a very complex institutional environment. They face a very complex technical environment. They've got things like analytics and reporting to deal with. They've got dependent sites. They've got those sites built in Drupal or built in a, a platform that are dependent on a centralized service, you know, because they're, they're smaller sites, they're focused and that sort of thing. But they also have a lot of independent sites. Again, the uh, sites that are built by donors, the sites that are built by, um, uh, by investment in uh, intellectual property, those sorts of things. And those could be built on anything. They could be Drupal, they could be WordPress. They could, in fact, we've got one client who does an awful lot of stuff in GoDaddy. You know, just throw stuff up there when it's cheap and easy. You know, so how do you manage all that? How do you get back to that brand security, content control, data security, that sort of thing? You gotta deal with social media. You know, social media is a reality, you have to deal with it. How do I make my social media messaging and my web messaging work well together? How do I make sure they're coordinated? How do I protect my website from inappropriate social media sometimes? Sometimes, you know, you'll have professors out there. We've got one client who, um, who offers websites to their, um, uh, to their faculty. And these websites are funny. I mean, some of them are really good. Uh, one of them uh, is essentially just a bunch of pictures of spiders on drugs. You know, and so, how, again, my favorite client. So how, do you, so how do you deal with kind of that level of complexity and content? Um, we've got person-to-person -person applications that are starting to come on. As more and more people start looking at uh, um, distance learning and uh, learning uh, off-site, how do you deal with that? Mobile applications, central services uh, for the web, and then again, university systems, their, their identity providers, their uh, learning management systems, the calendaring systems. How does all of that stuff integrate? How do I get all of this disparate stuff to work together? And what does Drupal do for, the, do for me there? All right, we're gonna take one step back. I told you we're gonna talk about mammalian biology. Here's the story, here's how you do it. We do it the way mammals do it. After five days, essentially, this is what a human looks like after five, day, five days after fertilization. What is that? It's essentially the core. It's essentially the start of, uh, the start of your whole body. You have to, in fact, organize the core before you can differentiate any of the, the extremities. So the very first thing that you see, the very first recognizable thing after five days, a blastocyst, is really just a circle with a hole in it, okay? And that's what we need to start taking a look at. We need to start taking a look at the core of our system before we really worry about the extremities and how different they can be. Um, in EDU, that means identifying and promoting common data and services. So instead of trying to take Drupal and say it's gonna be a one size fits all, what, we, what we're saying is, let's figure out what all people need and give them that. And then from there, let them differentiate the extremities. Uh-oh, there we go. So what does that mean? Well, what we think that means is that there are two different kinds of things that you might want to think about in Drupal that you might wanna think about when you're building an infrastructure, that you might wanna think about when you're thinking about how to manage complexity in a very diverse environment. And those two things are core services. What are core servers? What are those things, those pieces of data, those pieces of service that everybody needs, regardless of where they got their money, regardless of what message you're trying to tell, regardless of who built the site, what are those core services or data that everyone needs? And then another thing is, you know, what about common features? 
What about the things that most people want? They may not be considered core services, but what about most people? And how do I get those things to talk to this great big environment of technology? Well, we think there's a common foundation. And, and, we think, and we talk a lot about this with our universities. And what we've found over the years is that there is a really a common foundation of services. Um, there really is a core that can be identified that you can start to aspire to to start providing some meaning around your overall implementation. And those core services, content distribution and aggregation across platforms. How do I take content that might be created on a number of different platforms, whether they're a number of different independent Drupal platforms or a number of different platforms that aren't Drupal, the Joomla's, the WordPress's, the, uh, the raw sites of CSS and HTML and PHP that you might find out there. We think that content distribution and aggregation, the ability to get it out and get it back and understand it is really important. We think that con uh, common cross-site uh, or cross-system identity management is important. How do you identify a user across a bunch of different sites, across a bunch of different implementations? That's another core service. Those are things that we really need to think about. An organizational structure, uh, tax, uh, an organizational structure, taxonomy, and hierarchy. What we mean by that is, okay, so now I've got some core service. I've got content. I can distribute it pretty much anywhere. I can get it anywhere. I can identify my users who come along, and I can make sure that they've got the right roles and permissions. But how do I describe my organization? How do I describe my information architecture? How do I describe the complex relationships between schools in my university and departments in schools and programs that departments provide and how do the faculty connect and what does the course look like inside of all these programs? How do I describe all of those different relationships and how can I do it in a way that everyone can use the same description? They may not use the whole description, but they use the same description. And how can I provide that information in a way that regardless of when I'm looking for information, I can see it in context? And then finally, integrated integration APIs. Um, the ability to expose the core features, things like content distribution, organizational structure, identity management, expose those to a much wider environment. How do I build an API infrastructure that allows me to access services, whether I'm a Drupal 6 site, a Drupal 7 site, a Drupal 8 site, a WordPress site, whatever happens. Um, so we think that that common foundation is the thing that we really want to focus on with, uh, uh, with our clients. We really want the universities that we uh, talk to to focus on. Think about the common things that everybody needs. We think there's also some shared needs. Uh, besides those core functions, we think that there's a lot of shared things that a lot of people could use. Maybe not everybody, you know, in your, in your uh, organization. Maybe not everybody in your web ecosystem, but we think there's a lot of them. So, for instance, things like comprehensive, flexible editorial, man editorial management, uh, essentially content government governance. And we mean flexible, and we mean really flexible. We'll run into universities where they'll say, okay, this program over here has got a bunch of rogues, and we don't want them publishing content without someone taking a look at it first, so we have to put some control over it. And we've got this part of the organization over here that's got a lot of power, a lot of money, and a lot of talent, and they don't need our, our input. We want to know when content comes out, but we don't have to really govern it as much as we have to over there. We need to be flexible about, about those sorts of things. Things like search and social optimization. Basically, how do I reach the right audience with the right message at the right time? How do I make sure that that audience finds me and when they land on me, when they land on my site, they're getting the right message? We talk a lot about, uh, when we talk to our clients, about uh, a concept called negative aging. Negative aging essentially is a, a concept that says if a system has been in play, the longer it's been in play and working, the more likely it's going to continue to work. If it's going to fail, it's going to fail fast. If it's not going to fail, it's not going to fail for a long time. So essentially, Microsoft uh, engineers over the last couple of years have identified that websites exhibit negative aging tr uh, characteristics. Essentially, what they say is, look, if someone's going to jump off your site, they're going to jump off really fast. And the longer they stay, the less likely they are to leave. That's what we mean by when we uh, talk about reaching the right audience at the right time. Give them the right message and give them a reason to stay. Um, event registration, or event integration, encouraging engagement. Again, lots of our organizations manage lots of different events and lots of different calendars. How do I integrate that across a whole platform to make sure that these events and these calendars and these sorts of things get seen by the right folks and get, uh, get attended properly? 
talk about brand security and flexibility. How do I make sure that the theming that I do on my Drupal sites or the, or the presentations that I have are secure and flexible? We had one organization who said, man, we really love the design that our, uh, our, our core uh, or our, uh, our, our central um, uh, marketing team came up with, but we can't change it. We can't change anything about it. We love the design, but I just want my, my school's logo here. You know, someone just gave me $100 million to build a building. We should maybe put his face on this page. So, you know, it's those sorts of levels of flexibility that we're talking about when we talk about brand security. Let's make sure the brand looks good. And flexibility. Let's make sure that we can be flexible in our branding. Analytics uh, to measure progress and success. You know, everyone wants to know, hey, how did we do? How is the website doing? Are we getting more conversions? Are they the right conversions? How are people bouncing around on our site? Can I understand it better and can I make better plans for the future? And then finally, one of the things we think is important for the future is classroom engagement tools. The ability to engage your student or, or a teacher student, regardless of where that student happens to be. Instead of having a student have to schlep all the way across campus to go to an office, to go to a professor's office because they, have, they maintain office uh, hours at five to six every day, let's get them online. Let's get those, uh, those uh, office hours online. Let's get students and, and uh, teachers and faculty um, integrating and, uh, and talking online. Um, and uh, you know, so we think that that's probably also another feature that's kind of interesting for folks. So those are kind of some of the, the challenges that folks you know, run into. And it's some of the things that we think you might want to think about when, uh, when you're building your system. So let's talk a little bit about the big finish. Where do we go from here? We talked about the challenges facing you. Did I just go down here again? Oh. I'm sorry. I moved one around. We talked about uh, these challenges together, changing demographics, emerging technologies, uneven distribution. These are all the challenges that we're facing. So if we're going to solve them, the question is why? Why would we even go about this? You know, a lot of organizations have been doing fine throwing out 1,200 uh, websites. You know, they may be collapsing under the pressure of trying to maintain them. Uh, one organization spent four months fixing Drupal Geddon because they didn't have deep, you know, great control over their environments. So the question is, why do we want to do this? And we, I believe that there are three reasons you do anything in business or, or uh, in technology. And the first reason is you do it because you want to make money. That's the first reason. If you, if you solve these problems, how do you make more money? Well, by, by having brand security and distribution and better distribution, I can increase eyeballs. If I control my brand a little better and I increase its distribution through all different kinds of channels, I can get more eyeballs on my brand and more eyeballs mean more applications. And more applications mean more enrollment. And more enrollment means more money. Audience segmentation. Okay. The other thing I can think about is can I segment my audience? Can I understand the difference between a parent and a 17-year-old and an alumni and a donor? And even more interestingly, can I identify a donor who has a 17-year-old? Because those are the really good ones. <laughs> All right. So we really want to think about, you know, we do this because we want to segment the audience. We want to get better message penetration. Another reason why. We do it because we want to save money. Organizations do things with technology because they want to make money or they do it because they want to save money. All right, so how do you save money doing this? Reduce complexity, okay? Reduce redundancy. Improve serviceability, operability, and uh, flexibility. If we can find ways to better control the complexity of our environments and find ways to better share common services and common data, we can make these kinds of things happen and actually save money for our universities. And then the third reason anybody does anything, you do it because you have to, or competitive imperative. You do it to stay in the game. Everybody else is doing it. And you know, it's back, to, it's back to grade five again. Everybody else is doing it, so you gotta do it too. All right, and competitive imperative becomes a really important thing in this environment. The e market is changing. Com competition is coming from all kinds of different places, and we really want to avoid dissatisfaction. You know, um, again, a competitive imperative. Avoid dissatisfaction. It's an interesting little story. Um, my first job was in a town called Sheboygan, Wisconsin, which is about a, uh, my first computer job, which is about an hour north of Milwaukee. <coughs> and there was a guy who's, who was my age at the time. I thought he was an old guy back then. There was a guy who uh, was my age at the time, and he said, you know, John, 
He says the most important thing that you have to do when you're dealing with customers and when you're dealing with your people is avoid dissatisfaction. If you can avoid dissatisfaction in your customers, they're going to love you. He said, you may not always have everything they want, but avoid their dissatisfaction. And it's a competitive imperative now to do that. How do you do that? The message has to be right. It has to be what the person's looking for. It has to be easy to find. It has to be well integrated with the rest of the university. And it has to tell the right, the right story. The question is, how do you do all that stuff? How do you save money? How do you make money? How do you uh, implement a competitive imperative? How do you look for some sort of implementation or control over what is admittedly, and probably rightly so, a wild west kind of environment in most universities? Again, the how, focus on common needs and common goals. You don't have to do everything, but focus on those common needs and common goals, and Drupal can help you do that. Protect key assets from, di from drift. Protect your key messages, your key brand elements, your key you know, uh, ways of navigating the site, your information architecture, your content architecture, and develop centrally and distribute freely. Well, the real how is OpenEDU. So here's the sales pitch. <laughs> OpenEDU actually is an implementation of Drupal. We'll tell you a little bit about it. It's, it's essentially a Drupal um, uh, installation profile that provides services around all of these areas. Everything from social integration and media to analytics, uh, everything from APIs that allow you to share data and content types and taxonomies that allow you to construct everything from a, an information architecture to a course of study bulletin that it's hundreds of pages of long, uh, hundreds of pages long, describing departments and schools and programs inside of them. It's interfaces to your LMS systems to consume data and present data to other organizations. It's mobile application interfaces through the APIs. It's all of these different components that allow you to say, here's the stuff I really care about. Here's the data that everyone should have. Here's the function that everyone should share. And now once we have this core, let's go differentiate. Let's go make everybody look good based on this core. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. Yeah, that was herding cats. <laughs> right. I know you're all herding cats, but when you bring them into town, when you get all those cats together and you haven't lost a single one of them, you know you've won. By the way, thanks to EDS for that. They're the one who put that commercial out in about 1985 or 1986. And by the way, I did tell you that there was going to be a little story about uh, the uh, start of the uh, cloud. Ross Perot, um, God rest his soul, I think. I think he's dead now. Um, started a company called EDS uh, back in the day. One of the first things that he was doing was he was selling timeshares on mainframes. He invented the cloud. He invented it 30 years before it was called the cloud. And they gave us this great cat video. So thank you, EDS, for your time on that. And uh, that's hurting cats. That's what you're uh, faced with. And we think we might be able to help you out. What kind of questions do we have? Go ahead. <laughs> no, Demo, you can actually come down to the booth. And uh, we've got, in fact, we've got some of our key developers here who'd be more than happy to uh, do a demo. But we want to, what's that? 312? Oh, booth 312. Yeah, come on down. Any other questions? I'm going to turn this over. We've got another half of a presentation. We've got another uh, set of folks coming up to talk to you some more. Thank you very much for your time. Welcome, everybody. And uh, welcome to Building Dynamic Sites with Unified and Secure Customer Information. Maybe in white. That's okay. We'll, we'll fix this one. Right? This one? Yeah. Um, we're going to talk to you. We're going to talk to you today about uh, customer identity management, a little bit about the January platform, and then what we've been working on our new Drupal module. My name is David Minch. I'm the director of engineering at January. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm Rebecca Golden. I've, I'm a senior software engineer at Janrain. I helped build the module. And I've been working with Drupal since 2005. I actually 
I don't know how many of you were at the keynote, but um, when Dries talked about the OzCon booth that they had in Portland, Oregon, I was there. And that was when my interest in Drupal began. Okay, so uh, identity management. Um, it's really about, in, I'm not sure if I'm close enough. Identity, ma uh, identity management, it's really about engaging with your customer, giving them a reason to, to log in or sign in and giving you um, their personal information that you can store and then following that up with the, an, an ability to do some analytics segment on that and actually provide a personalized interaction with every customer that's coming to your site. It all starts with the customer journey, and this is really about keeping that, that personalization or branding or whatever you have that, that, is, that says that it, it, that it is your site and keeping that similar and consistent across all the devices that the customers are using, whether it's their laptop or their desktop or their iPad or their mobile phone. The easiest way to explain this is to actually tell a little bit of a story. One of our customers, Whole Foods, is, um, is a very good integration and a very good uh, sample store here or use case. So I don't know how many of you share some of the, uh, the tasks at home with your spouse. But last Thursday, it was my job to actually do the cooking and plan the meals. So I didn't actually take enough time to do this. So I was at towards the end of the day, only had about five minutes left before my next meeting. I decided it was probably time to go ahead and tackle this. So I went up to the Whole Foods website and took a look at their recipes. Well, lo and behold, there's a lot of different recipes to choose from, and I didn't really have time to go through them all. So what I ended up doing was I wanted to take a look at my current um, re my, my, my recipe box that, that I... Uh, had up there before. So I wanted to take a look at, at recipes that I knew would actually go well for the family, something that we tried before and was, was considered good. But that required me to sign in. So I click the sign in button, and up comes this dialog. Makes it super simple to actually sign in. Using my Facebook or my Google or Yahoo or Twitter account, I can sign in. I can actually create my own registration um, sign in as well, or account and quickly sign in. Once signed in, I have actually have access to my saved recipes. At that point, I can pick one out. So we'll go, we'll go for the top one, just because I'm in a hurry. We'll go for the tangy bean salad with carrots. And clicking on that, I can go to the next step. And I decide, all right, so we probably have a lot of these ingredients already at home not sure exactly which ones we have at home or not. Don't really have time to deal with that. Easiest thing to do is just, just to save it to my shopping list. Also, I note that it really only serves four. But, you know, my younger son, he's probably not going to eat this anyway. So uh, we'll just, I'm pretty sure we've got peanut butter and jelly at home. We can slap that into pita and probably be okay there too. So once I've done that, I can take a look at my shopping list. Yeah, I'm good. Everything's all right. Shut down the website. I can run off to my meeting. Everything's good. We've got a Whole Foods that's close to home, so I can stop on my way home, pick up the ingredients, and I'm covered. On my way home, stop at home at Whole Foods. I've got my phone, go back to the website on my mobile, and all of a sudden, it knows who I am because I've been there before, don't have to log in even, and I have access to my shopping list. So there I have it. Pretty, pretty darn simple. You know, I know that we've got carrots, don't need to pick those up, but I pretty much need everything else on the list. So, but, it, but wait, there's more. Um, once we get home, put away the groceries, and it's time to actually make, make, to, to make the dinner. At that point, I can pull out my iPad, go back to the website, pull up the recipe, and all of a sudden I've got the steps that I need to do so. All because I have this seamless integration across all my devices, tied to my account because it's because Whole Foods knows who it is that's logged in and what I'm trying to do. Dinner was a success. Everything worked out. Although I got to say it didn't actually look like the picture. 
So the Jan Rain platform or portfolio helps you tie together content, community, and commerce. It's, uh, we, do quite, we do quite a bit. So one of the, uh, when I started working at Jan Rain, what, uh, some of these numbers actually threw me at first. It's, it's kind of interesting. So social login, providing social login to your site improves registration by about 50%. Maybe even more than that, I don't know. But we can go with 50%. Some of this is already vetted. Um, the piece that was kind of throws me, and it makes sense to a certain degree, but more than 70% of those registrations are traditional. What that means is that the users, those traditional users are signing in creating their account, creating an account with an email address and not sharing their Facebook information or their Google information per se. They're creating a specific account. Dr. Pepper, another one of our customers, does a great job of this seamless integration across devices. You can see that the same brand and same look and feel is across all their devices, whether you're Android, iPhone, or website. It's, it's, it's a great job. So having those customers sign in and give you their personal information is really what it's all about. Obtaining that information allows you to differentiate on them. This is just a sample of some of the fields or some of the information that you can obtain, but you can actually customize this and tailor this to your needs so that you can actually determine what it is that, uh, and how you differentiate and how you personalize it for your customers. Once you have that information, then you can do analysis on who they are. It's not really about, at this point in time, it's not gonna be about what's trending in the world or what's trending in the region. It's about what's trending with the people who are coming to your site. So you can take a look at what they're tweeting on, what they're liking on Facebook, and a lot of different information again, to help you personalize and help you get that engagement so that they want to sign in and log in and give you that information. For those of you who already have some sites, we actually integrate to quite a few different uh, third-party services. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to start over. You can actually just add Jan Rain to it and augment some of the, some of the, uh, augment your current system by adding Janrain to it. Another one of our customers is NBC Sports. They did a really interesting, um, they used our screen, our second screen experience during the, one of the Sunday night football games. I, and they might have done this more than once, I'm not entirely sure, but I know that, 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 that they have done it at least once. During a commercial, they ask the, the audience, which is really this online audience, they ask the audience how, what, what they thought of, the, of a referee call. You can see that uh, the referee was overruled by the social media. Not that it changed the game output, but it actually gave that engagement experience where people wanted to log in, they wanted to actually participate, and they wanted to tell the ref that he was wrong. So this is another great way to engage with your customers. So what does this mean for Drupal? And how do you get your site to actually do some of this stuff? Well, I'm gonna hand it over to Rebecca and she's gonna talk about what we've been working on. So Drupal, um, what we've done is we've built a new version of our module that has several sub-modules underneath of it, each of which um, allows you to integrate a different part of our services. And when we were designing this, we decided that we had some really specific z design goals. This is version three of our module, and we've learned a lot. And first and foremost, we decided we really needed to follow the Drupal way. We were going to use Drupal rules, blocks, fields, we were going to use everything that Drupal offered instead of trying to reinvent it. We also simplified deployment. Um, configuration of the 
Yeah. Configuring Janrain um, now just requires a few fields and a form on the configuration pages, so it's really quick and easy. And also by using Drupal blocks, instead of having people have to learn code that they would insert, um, it just is a lot easier. Um, we also improved the support process. Uh, sometimes configuration can go wrong. There might be a space at the end of your URL. We are trimming, but let's just say there's a space at the end of the URL that you put into our form. We have an information tab that shows what you've put in so that we can look at it and say, wow, you've got a trailing space, or did you know that you switch two letters around and if you try fixing that it'll work in an instant. So we really wanted to make things easier both for support on our end and for you to be supported. And then we really wanted to plan for future releases by separating our package out into a core module and then a series of sub modules. We were able to make it so that we can make adjustments to social sharing without necessarily affecting the login that you have enabled on your site. Or in the future, we might also add additional sub-modules offering other things like the ability for commenting to be tracked across a variety of websites. Like if you wanted to have someone's comment show up on a WordPress site that a partner owned as well as your Drupal site, um, we really want to be able to add those things in the future. So Dries during the keynote talked about how Drupal was originally built by developers for developers and eventually there was that cycle of knowing that there were also users outside of developers using Drupal. We also went through something of an epiphany like that where we realized it wasn't just the visitors that we were building for who would benefit from what we offer and it wasn't just site administrators um, who we realized we needed to scale back permissions on um, so that they couldn't necessarily change the configuration page after a developer <laughs> had configured it correctly. We realized we were also building for developers, so we sort of did this backwards. Um, but we wanted to make sure that developers had the freedom to integrate as many or as few sub-modules as they wanted. We wanted to give them a lot more control because, you know, I'm a developer and I want more control. Um, and again, integrating with rules and blocks so that there are some familiar things to work with. Um, all right, so here's your Drupal site. I like the laser pointer. So you have a Drupal site, or you have a thousand Drupal sites. You could have any number. It doesn't actually matter. Um, then you find our core module. We tried to keep the requirements to the absolute minimum. We really didn't want to add a lot of other module requirements, but there were some that were really necessary. Um, the core module doesn't actually do anything on your Drupal site. When you enable it, it creates a bunch of hooks and functions, and it starts handling error messages that come out of Janrain in a PHP sort of formatted manner instead of in JSON formatting, so it comes a, a lot easier to read. So what this actually is, is a really nice foundation where if you decided you didn't like any of the sub-modules we implemented and you wanted to do it your own way and just start with putty and build like some Michelangelo statue, that we would have that basic part available so you wouldn't have to figure out Janrain just to implement it on Drupal. So the Janrain core alone is really just to build custom code on top of to create functionality of your choice. We have sub-modules, which is the code we imagine someone would want to build, but we acknowledge that you might decide you want to build something completely different. All right. The first sub-module of importance is the admin user interface. This creates a configuration page with a form where you can enter the configuration information necessary to connect to Janrain services. The reason why we created this separately from the core module was because we were noticing that a lot of times sites had people who built the site, the site builder and they would configure everything, and then they'd go, and the site administrator, who's mostly supposed to be administering content, would come in and say, oh, well, I'll 
just go ahead and type here and accidentally save things and change the configuration. So we wanted it to be possible to turn off configuration. It's still saved in the system, but now your site admins can't necessarily modify your configuration pages. So it's just one more level of if you're the builder and the administrator, leave it on, it's good. But if you want to limit the amount that people can change configuration, you can configure, turn off that sub-module, and then your site administrators can't actually go in and muck about. Um, so here it is. This actually probably would have been a good slide for all of that. Um, the admin UI connects to core and the, admin, the configuration pages. Um, if you're only using our social login, all that's needed is the API key that's on the Janrain dashboard one thing and you're up and running. Um, and then if you're using social login and registration, which offers a lot more, there are a few more things that we need to know. There's an application URL, your credentials, and then there's a zip file that has some markup and JavaScript that we need um, to be able to fully support registration. Um, these aren't difficult to get. Uh, just contact our delivery people. Um, all right, so the next th sub-module is Janrain social sharing. If you have social sign-on and social sharing configured, then you can have, well, let's go here, a field on your Drupal site that allows people to share content. That field can be attached to articles, pages, any sort of pages, basic pages, kitten pages. Basically, it's a way for people to share the content on your site with Twitter, with Facebook, with anything. Well, not anything, but a lot. And a lot of you probably know how adding fields to content looks and we have documentation that describes it in more depth, but really we just create a field that you add to content. It's that simple. Enable the sub-module, add the field to your content, and you're in. And it looks like this. Um, so there's the article I created <laughs> with the ever so descriptive text, and there's the share. I could share on Twitter, Facebook, or via email. The Janrain user interface is a widget, basically, that pre-formats the business logic and the look of registration. It's really good for having consistent sign-in and registration across multiple sites. Um, Yahoo libraries used to do this, where when you sign into anything Yahoo, you would go to the same sign-in page, no matter what it was, because they wanted that consistent feel. So we provide that. And if you enable the Janrain user interface uh, sub-module, you get blocks. So you configure your site, you have blocks, you add the blocks to your content wherever you want them. There's social login, email verification, password recovery, um, edit profile. And this is the social login. We really were going for making this as simple as possible. Um, part of me feels like, look at how easy it is, but let me tell you about the months I spent building this. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about the months I spent building this. All right. The Janrain user interface and social share can both live on the same page at the same time. We've tested it very thoroughly. They do not conflict. Um, and then there's Janrain data. This is one of those amazing things. This is one of my favorite things about our services. So with Janrain data, you can take information that lives in the profile that we store and through the core connect, get the data, and with Drupal rules, use it in any way you want. It is amazing. We used to have this weird sort of uh, mapping thing that we built ourselves, but again, this goes back to using the Drupal way and being a better Drupal community member, where we're just feeding into rules. 
and it makes, well here, let me just, so here's a rule that you could create where we accept the JSON string where you point to your profile and the birthday and then you choose a destination which is a field, birthday, and every time a person logs in, that field will get updated by Drupal rules. It's based on a JanRain event that we created. So, imagine you're PetSmart, which is one of our customers. I don't have the really nice slides that David does, but just imagine. And um, you're accepting me as a traditional registration person. I'm coming and I'm giving you my email and I'm creating a password and there's a form and they say, hey, what's your pet's name? And when's your pet's birthday? And I go, oh, my pet, my pet is Linus and his birthday is in September of 1999. And so then September rolls around and I come to your site and your site says, hey Rebecca, and happy birthday Linus. So immediately I'm like, wow, you remembered Linus's birthday. Well, that's pretty impressive, not too impressive, but pretty awesome. But what you're offering is a 20% off coupon. And specifically, you've noticed that Linus is old. So you're not offering chew toys you're offering a heated bed for Linus, like one of those really nice cat beds that doesn't get too hot. And I'm like, wow, not only are you giving me a coupon, but you're giving me a coupon for something Linus would actually like for his birthday. That's personalization. Beyond that, let's say I logged in with my Facebook account. My Facebook account will tell you that I have liked every Marvel movie ever. Well, not ever, for at least the last 10 years. And so I log in, you go through my Facebook likes, you say, wow, she really likes Marvel. And suddenly on my homepage of your site, you're promoting all the reviews and articles about Age of Ultron. And I think, this is awesome. They have everything I want. You have more than what I want, but because you're promoting the things that I'm interested in, I think that you know me. I think that you and I have Age of Ultron in common, and it is awesome. Seriously, here, laser pointer, seriously. All right, so again, we tested really thoroughly, share, user interface, and generating data with Drupal rules work really well together. And in fact, they work so well together that we wanted to sort of give an example of how well they work together, and we created the example submodule. The example submodule is the full on, we replace Drupal sign in, we place the blocks, we create an edit profile tab in your slash user slash three page. Um, this is the we do everything for you. But we aren't assuming that this is how you're going to want it done. What we're doing is we're providing an example of how to replace sign in, how to put a tab on the profile page that's generating specific for the edit profile that goes back up to the big database in the sky. Um, and it incorporates the user interface and the Drupal rules data connection. You'll notice that it does not put social sharing on pages. It is so easy to put social sharing on pages. It's a field and everybody has such different content. We decided that you don't even need the example for that. So we built the example around a sort of slightly more complex use case. These are the files. I know this is the exciting part. Oh, these are the files in my code. Um, and this is an example of some of the code that we wrote. Um, if this looks delightful, that means that you write modules and you think this is fun. If this is just confusing, it means you need to find someone who thinks writing modules is fun and hire them to create your own sub-module. Um, this is creating a page for password recovery and reset. This is creating the birthday field to accept um, the incoming data for mapping. So we programmatically create fields that we know are going to be populated by generating data. And then this is an example of how the rules are written. You'll see where the on generating data profile updated. So when a person logs in, the data profile is updated. And then at that point, generating data map goes into action. It grabs the JSON path to the profile. 
and maps it onto the field that's been specified. The nice thing about this, the amazing thing about this, is if you have a thousand sites, you can write a submodule and you could call it Rebecca submodule. And you could put in all the rules that you want across all those thousand sites, whether you're actually the administrator for them or not. And then you can hand that submodule to other people in your organization and say, hey, install this, it'll take care of all the mapping for you. It will take care of all the block placement. It puts sign in where we want it. And you suddenly have a consistent user experience and consistent business logic across your disparate sites. Plus, with what we offer, the data, the data about the people can be shared across to other systems like WordPress or Joomla or whatever that crazy second cousin of the business your business has in Russia is using, you know. Um, all right, so rambling. Uh, anyway, so we've created a whole bunch of blocks, essentially, not Drupal blocks, but sort of building blocks in the example case that you can build from. So there was core that you could take putty and build something, whatever you want. And then there's the example, which you could create your own and be a master builder. And that's basically it. Um, just in time, too. All right, so our website is janrain.com. Our Twitter is at janrain. If you have general questions, support at Janrain is really good. Uh, we also have a booth. It's 4, 418? 4811. Oh, 811. Oh, I'm completely off. Thank you, guys. This is my extremely wonderful and supportive marketing team, without whom I would not be here. Um, as always, the sessions feedback are vital for DrupalCon. The 1791 node is actually for both of the sessions that we're in here. And we really appreciate your coming and listening. I'm so proud. This is like my Oscar. I just built a module. Hi. <laughs> so thank you. Oh. And even though it's 6 o'clock, if anyone has questions that you don't want to wait and talk to us at the booth, I'm really happy to answer them. Um, I highly recommend just trying to create your own sub-module off our example module because it's fun and we commented our code and it's, yeah, a good way to get started. <laughs>